Uh-oh. Welcome to everyone that's just joining. We will get started um, in just a couple of minutes. Welcome to everyone that has joined. We'll give it a minute and then we will get started. Okay, looks like we have critical mass. Uh, so let's let's kick this off. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grayston's first ever cyber seminar, Open Hiring 101. We're excited to spend the next hour with you all and share with you an overview of open hiring and why removing barriers to employment is so important, particularly now. Um, this is brought to you in partnership with the American Sustainable Business Council, an advocacy group that supports the interests of responsible companies. So thank you, ASBC, for your support of our work. Uh, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Sarah Marcus. I'm the director of our Center for Open Hiring here at Grayston. At the center, we try to inspire and educate companies on why and how they can remove barriers to employment. Um, and create job opportunities, no questions asked. Ultimately, our goal is for others to learn from us and replicate this model in a way that suits them, their business. Um, and then we also measure the impact of those pilots to further bolster the case for open hiring. Um, today, you will hear from a few different individuals because you definitely don't wanna hear me talk at you for an hour. Um, I will start with a quick definition of open hiring um, to ground everyone as to what we are here to talk about. I'll then hand it off to Joe Kenner, Grayson's president and CEO. He will share his perspective on the challenges facing businesses and society today and how open hiring is a human capital management model that can actually meet those challenges by both improving business outcomes and addressing deeply rooted um, economic and racial inequality. We'll then hear from Sanitha Maliakal. She's our director of supply chain at Grayston Bakery and also manages our relationship with our biggest customer, Ben and & Jerry's. And she understands this model better than most because she works hand in hand with our open hires every day to deliver exceptional product to our customers. And she'll walk us through um, how is this model actually practiced at Grayston um, and also address some of the concerns that we know are probably on your mind as you consider the viability of a model like this. Next, um, I will do a Q&A with Trish Patton, the VP of Human Resources from The Body Shop, and we thank her very much for, for joining us today. Uh, they have piloted open hiring in their distribution center and are now making plans to roll it out to their retail stores. So we'll hear from Trish about why they made this decision and, and how it went. 
And at the end, we will have um, a few minutes for Q&A. So please use the Q&A feature to submit questions throughout. And my colleague, Erica Christensen, will moderate um, at the end. At the end, she'll, she'll look at the questions and moderate the end and help us get through as many as we can. Um, and we'll certainly keep track of those that we can't get to and, and find a way to try and, try and address them after the call. So with that, let's start with what is open hiring? For those who are tuning in with no prior background, um, open hiring is a no questions asked hiring policy. That means we don't do background checks, we don't look at resumes, we don't drug test, we don't conduct interviews, we don't require certain degrees. For our entry level manufacturing jobs, we hire the next person off of a list in the order that their name appears. We trust in the potential of anyone that comes through our doors to be successful. And so instead of spending money screening people out, we invest those resources to increase the likelihood of success on the job for those who do come through our door. Now, not everyone works out. Uh, we have a business to run and this is not a social service program and we certainly have to let people go. But when we do so, we have a long list of folks that are, we can hire immediately into those roles some of whom are potentially incredible employees. They just don't necessarily make it through traditional hiring processes for a large number of potential reasons. Um, we'll get lots more into lots more detail about why we do this and, and how it works. Um, but before I pass it off, my final request is just to keep an open mind over the next hour and to really approach this from the standpoint of what could this mean for you and for your business? Normally when we work with companies, we spend two days immersing them um, in the ins and outs of the model through something called, we call the learning lab. But right now we're at a moment in time when the urgency has never been greater and we want to reach as many people as possible through the tools that we're all now accustomed to using. So that, that is why we're doing this. Um, and we know for some of you who haven't had much, much exposure to open hiring before, this is going to seem pretty out there, but this moment in time we're in has forced us to question many aspects of how we've done things in the past. So if you feel yourself feeling skeptical, that's fine, acknowledge it. Um, but just keep in mind that it's incumbent upon all of us right now, I think, to, to reimagine how we can do things differently and we build better. And we hope that learning about open hiring today will give you an idea about where you might be able to start. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Joe Kenner, our president and CEO. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks to ASBC for partnering with us. Um, I'm excited about today's uh, cyber webinar and uh, really excited to hear from our friend Trish Patton from The Body Shop. Um, we're gonna have a great time uh, listening to the exchange between her and Sarah. But um, what I wanted to do during this time is just kind of walk you through the journey of Grayston, how we've been walking the walk these last 38 years. I uh, want to make sure you understand uh, why this moment is so critical for all of us that are on this call. And then three, why open hiring is the solution for um, what we're talking about, uh, particularly during this, these uh, times of pandemic and social unrest. Um, we feel we have a real a, a strong answer to the uh, issues that the country is facing right now, what businesses are facing right now. So let me begin just with who we are uh, as Grayston. And you'll see we've been on this journey for quite some time, and it's been quite an amazing journey for us, um, beginning with our founding in 1982. Um, we've developed an amazing partnership with Ben and Jerry's in 1987. Uh, we launched a workforce development training program in 2008. Um, and in 2012, we became New York State's first um, equal, which was a very exciting time for us. But now we're at this point um, in 2018 where we launched what we call the Center for Open Hiring. And that is really what's laying the groundwork and the foundation for where we want to go forward, um, balance of year 2020, but even beyond that. And that is how do we take this message of inclusive hiring and open hiring in particular to the next level? And that gets into why now? And why, why do we even want to have this kind of conversation? And really, we're at a critical point in our history as, as a country and as a society in general. And what I really want you to take from this slide is you know, now is our watershed moment. This is the time to make things happen. Why do I say that? 
Uh, if you look at last year when the Business Roundtable changed uh, their focus from the shareholder primacy to stakeholder capitalism, that really kind of set things in motion. Uh, following that statement, uh, you know, our colleagues in the B, the B Corp community followed up with uh, the Business Roundtable and said, thank you very much. We applaud your efforts. Uh, but now it's time to put those, put the statements and, you know, the policy statements and the support into action. And we're seeing why that was so critical. We're seeing why folks had to make that change. And we look at the pandemic and what that has revealed, um, really in terms of ripping the Band-Aid off of the wound that we knew was been festering for decades of, you know, lack of access to opportunities, to employment, to healthcare, to a host of issues that are now being exposed um, in this day and age. And, and obviously following the pandemic, we had all the social unrest, whether it was George Floyd, and just, you know, again, this whole dialogue and this whole uh, issue of uh, inequality, and social justice, racial justice. Um, this is a moment in time that we strongly believe uh, that we need to make some changes. Businesses needs to make some changes. And we have a track record and a background that addresses all of those issues, whether it's the access to employment opportunity, whether it's the access to developing a new strategy and truly having a mind shift in how we look at, Sarah referred to open hiring as a human capital strategy. And it is that. It's a talent management strategy as well. And it's a, a holistic way of looking at how do we take care of our employees? How do we join them on this journey of employment and really see that they're thriving, not just at home, uh, but in the job as well. So as you look at businesses, you know, what are, you know, what can the businesses do, but more importantly, what are they struggling with right now? Um, and in two areas that we're really looking at here, uh, we can look at the business challenges and we can also look at the social challenges, but I'll begin with the business challenges uh, first off. And, you know, the, the significant costs, and we, we can look at this in terms of time, we can look at this in terms of money uh, that is spent, you know, screening folks, uh, hundreds of applications, depending on your organization for entry level roles. And then looking at, you know, turnover, uh, again, a cost of trying to having to bring folks in time and time again and train them over again. There's a cost to that. But then there's also this other challenge um, and the, the, the latest you know, current events, this is bringing it to the fore as well. There's this demographic and I would say a psychographic of folks looking for purpose, um, whether it's the employee looking for the purpose in their job or the businesses actually looking for their purpose in this society in terms of how, how can we be more mission minded as an organization. On the other side is you have these social challenges that businesses are facing. Um, we know, you know, 20 million unemployed um, due to the pandemic. Um, the, there's an econo economic downturn. Folks are losing their jobs. The economy uh, is it's, it, it's, it's struggling right now. And businesses are struggling right now to stay, to stay open. Uh, the other piece of that is just a lack of awareness and access to supportive services. And I know my colleague, Sunitha, will get into this, but employees are looking for other support outside of the technical support of their jobs. They're just looking for support, you know, am I safe? How can I address some of the mental health issues that I'm going through? Or maybe some of our employees are dealing with access to child care or child support. Um, we actually have a social worker on site at the bakery and Sunitha can talk more about that. But it's those types of supports that employees are also looking to that impacts their job. It impacts whether they can fully show up for work if they show up at all. But the companies can do something to address those issues outside of the normal course of human resources practices. And the last piece is just, you know, many individuals just, you know, unnecessarily are excluded from the workforce. And, and we know this at Grayston, uh, just given how we hire and who we hire, whether it's the returning citizen, whether it's the veteran, whether it's someone dealing with recovery or even a single mother that just can't make it to work because she's got to deal with childcare and it's the resources and the, you know, the ability to access those resources are just not there. But at the end of the day, when we can tackle some of these business challenges as well as these social challenges, it actually not only makes the business stronger, but it also makes the organization stronger uh, and, the, and the employee stronger. But when we address both of these challenges, it's not, and I say this all the time, it is not profit 
at the expense of environment or at the expense of some other issue. It's, it's both and. We can have a strong, profitable business, but we can also have a strong workforce as well. And that's what open hiring is all about. So in terms of our solution, you know, it, there are two, the, way, the ways we can look at this is, you know, what if we decided and made a conscious, intentional decision to say, we are going to reallocate our costs and we're gonna do it in this way. We're actually going to invest in bringing people in and keeping them in, as opposed to spending time, money, and resources on background checks, drug tests, interviews, all of these traditional practices that may work in some positions within an organization, but is it really necessary for the entry level job? And ask that question and challenge you know, our practices, challenge why do we need resumes, challenge why we need certain degrees or, or any other type of requirement that we have for employment. And think another way. How do we bring that towards onboarding our frontline workers, investing in both trainings of hard skills as well as soft skills, and then providing, as I said earlier, those wraparound support services for employees that is part of the job and keeping them in the job, but it's very necessary for that retention piece. Uh, and then if you look at the other pieces at the bottom of the slide here, uh, you know, this is how value gets created. And in, it can vary from business to business, but you know, a lot of focus on the hiring costs. There's a lot of focus on creating a more inclusive workforce, improving the workforce culture. Um, we get this question several times in the last week about turnover rates. And we really need to change how we think about that, particularly in, in the manufacturing industry. Uh, this is not an easy industry to be in if you're an employee. Uh, this, it's hard work, long hours. You're lifting, particularly at, ba at the bakery, you're lifting 50 pound bags of, of sh sugar and flour. It's a tough job. There is going to be turnover. Uh, but we have a core group. If you think, you know, I have about 70 jobs that we can give out at any given time at the bakery, you know, about 50 of those folks stick with us. And yes, the other 20 or so, they're going to rotate out. And that's what we would call turnover. But Let's think about that differently. If we know that the folks who are coming to our organization, into our organization, would not have had a job but for Grayston, that's not turnover, that's opportunity. That's access that we're providing to folks every time we provide a job to them. So I want us to begin thinking about turnover in a different way and thinking about it in that way in terms of opportunity and access. And yes, there will be some folks that leave because of attendance issues or they might leave because they just didn't show up on time, or they just weren't doing a good job. We don't judge you when you come in and we're not gonna judge you on the way out, but we are gonna give you an opportunity. And I think that's what needs, that's how we need to change the dialogue. And we can talk about that more during the Q and A. But I really wanted to set that up for Samika, who's now gonna talk about just the how we do it at the bakery and what that really looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'll hand it off to Samika and looking forward to the questions at the end. All right, thank you for that, Joe. Hi, everybody. Nice to be chatting with all of you today online. Um, so as you know, Sarah and Joe mentioned, my name is Sunitha Molly Eagle, and I'm our Director of Supply Chain here, and I oversee our relationship with Ben & Jerry's and Unilever. I've been with the company for uh, over seven years now, so I've had a really exciting opportunity to have a front seat to uh, not only how Open Hiring works, but also how that works in partnership uh, with Ben & Jerry's and Unilever and um, it's been really a privilege to kind of be in this be in this seat and learning what I've learned here but I take you through a little bit of how open hiring works I think people hear about the model and they they hear this you know really beautiful idea that we're going to open our doors and, and let people in with no questions asked um, but then we always we're always curious about the how right like what does that actually look like in the day-to-day -day? so you know to start off you know you'll see here we, we talk about non-judgment on the way in and non-judgment some of these words you'll see we're really taking it back to to Bernie Glassman and to our founding. So Bernie was a Zen Buddhist monk and a lot of his Zen Buddhist principles are really still infused in what we're doing today. So this idea of non-judgment is that it doesn't matter to us what your background has been. Um, whether you had spent time incarcerated, whether you haven't been able to find a job for language barriers before, your immigration status might be a challenge or a recent immigration might make you a little more uncomfortable pursuing jobs in traditional channels. Um, whether you're a working mother, like we see, we see people with all kinds of obstacles, but really uh, for us on the way in, we're not asking you any of those questions. So there's really this idea present of, it does not matter what you've done before you've come to these doors today. Um, 
all we ask for people to do really is come down to the bakery in person and sign up on what we call our job list here at the front door. They let us know they're interested. Uh, and then we start working down that list on a first come first serve basis. So there are no applications, there's no resumes, there's no background checks that we're conducting. You're simply putting your name down on a list. As our volumes fluctuate at the bakery and our need fluctuates, uh, we will start bringing in classes accordingly. So that, that number and how we hire, how many people we're hiring at any given time really depends on the success of the business. You know, so if we are uh, in our kind of peak, say first half of the year and we're flexing the production schedules up, then we are looking to bring classes in. Um, our HR team will call down that list first come first serve, bring a group in here to the bakery. Uh, we'll ask people if they want to work uh, and we'll start training them right away. Um, as you would imagine in food manufacturing and for any who are on the call and who have some experience in the space, you know, we have a lot of safety regulations and food quality regulations and all kinds of guidelines that we need to live up to as a food manufacturer, uh, especially working with some of the customers that we do. And so our, you know, bakers as they come on are really getting a fire hose of information uh, from the QA team and from the operations team on all the expectations that we're going to have out on the production floor. Uh, you know, as Joe mentioned earlier and Sarah mentioned as well, you know, we are eager to give people an opportunity, but at the same time, we need to make sure that we're fulfilling all of our obligations as a food manufacturer and delivering to what our customers expect from us. And, and that really means having team members on site with us who are uh, understanding those expectations, clear on what needs to be done and are kind of progressing the way we need them to after they start. Um, so once you come in and you've accepted the job, so say you come to your orientation and you say, you know, yes, I, I'm excited. I'd like to come to work. We're putting you on the schedule pretty immediately. So say if you had an orientation this week, you might be working on the bakery production floor next week. Uh, we start really training you on the job from there. So, you know, that first section you'll see in our holistic employee support and our accountability model is that onboarding and training. So that onboarding session, it's two days of a lot of classroom style training where you're learning about those safety and quality requirements. Uh, and then as you come on the floor, you're starting to really understand the equipment itself, the workflow, the process flow. Uh, you're starting to really just get into the day to day of how are we producing these brownies on the line. Um, during that time, um, there's a lot of informal buddying that goes on. I'll say that's one arena we've always been working on over the years is how do we create a real buddy system to help bring new people on uh, to the bakery team. But what we really see is a lot of informal mentoring that goes on. Um, you know, one of the things that is really special about being at the bakery is a lot of our teammates uh, are very local to the bakery. So most of our team lives right here in Southwest Yonkers. Uh, so there's a lot of familiarity and kind of community bonds that you'll see get onto the production floor. So so-and-so will know somebody or it's a cousin of somebody or a friend of somebody or they grew up with someone and those bonds will really play out on the floor as well as as bakers who've been here for some time start to kind of informally mentor the new teammates coming in. And that is something unique to having 100% open hiring. Everybody's been through that same kind of crucible of coming up through orientation and learning the job on the floor. Uh, so when they see someone new join, there's a lot of kind of hand holding that goes on naturally to bring that person in. Uh, in addition to that, you're being evaluated by your supervisors on a biweekly basis for uh, your ability to really learn the new skills you need to to manage the equipment we have out on the floor, uh, to meet all of those quality expectations, uh, but also your ability to be a team player, to take direction. You know, some of our teammates, this is their first job. You know, that's not true across the board. Again, we don't ask the question, right? So we have a lot of team members who come on uh, with a wide variety of job experiences behind them and who've worked in a number of different fields. Uh, but at the same time, we have team members who this is their first job. This is their first experience having a supervisor they have to answer to. And that certainly plays into the training that goes on uh, as we're bringing them through this apprenticeship part of their program. Um, for the accountability piece, you know, you apprentice for say anywhere from six to ten months uh, as you're working through that evaluation period you know once you pass and you graduate you become full-time line staff with us um, the accountability we're really speaking to here it kind of stretches across whether you're an apprentice or you're full-time you know accountability is really critical to what we do is making sure that we're very clear on the expectations for the team uh, and are holding people accountable to those standards appropriately you know um I'll say in my view in particular, working with Ben and Jerry's and Unilever over the years, uh, as some of you might imagine hearing the name Unilever, yes, Unilever is a very traditional global conglomerate in many ways. And so they love the fact that we are a values-led supplier and that we bring this really unique mission to the table and into their supply chain. But at the same time, they expect us to live up to the same standards that any other supplier might. And so that accountability you know, has to flow down through our, our relationship with our customers down to those relationships on the floor to say, 
yes, we're here to give you the opportunity. We want everybody here to have the chance to work. Also, we, we need to hit this order schedule on time. Uh, we need to hit this spec every single time. We need to resolve any quality issues in a very timely and effective manner. Um, and we really convey that accountability down to the team. You know, this is a, uh, it's a fundamental part to what we do. The success of the business is, is really important to making sure that that model is viable, that this open hiring model is viable. We demonstrate that through the success of the business. Finally, in that holistic model uh, is pathmaking. And this is something, you know, really, really special and unique to Grayston. Uh, pathmaking is both a philosophy and a practice. So it really came from this idea, again, from, from Bernie and those Zen Buddhist roots about what does it mean to support somebody on their path and illuminate the options before them as they are trying to create transformation in their life. And the way we execute that on a practical uh, in a practical sense here at the bakery and throughout actually the Grayston Mandala uh, is through the care coordinator that Joe referenced earlier. So we have a partnership with Westchester Jewish Community Services, who's the largest service provider here in Westchester County. And we co-fund a staff member who sits on site here at the bakery and provides an immediate resource to bakers for whatever need might arise. So, so as some of the team mentioned, that could be housing, that could be a childcare need, it could be a need for substance use uh, counseling, for mental health services, Whatever that might be, uh, the care coordinator is available to meet with that team member, have a confidential conversation with them and help them through something that might be very sensitive um, and is creating an obstacle to maintaining the job, uh, but find them these resources that we don't necessarily have in-house as a business. You know, when I, we started this position probably two, three years ago at this point, uh, when I first started here, we would struggle to figure out how to meet these kind of uh, extraneous needs for the team. Like we didn't have the skill set to be like, okay, how do I find somebody, the mental health counseling they're looking for? Um, I'm trying to worry about the supply chain and trying to figure that out. You know, we didn't have the resources of the bandwidth I think, to do this so well. And this partnership has really brought pathmaking to life in a really meaningful way for the team. And we've seen a real impact in maintaining bakers um, through that apprenticeship and into full-time employment where we were losing a lot more people early on in that apprenticeship phase. Uh, so that's a, the real kind of like quick and dirty about what goes on on the holistic employee support. Uh, and then finally here is non-judgment on the way out. You know, so as Joe mentioned, it, it doesn't work out with everybody, but with some people it does, right? So we have a core team on the bakery floor uh, with staff ranging who's had experience here anywhere from call it 10 to five years who have been here for a good length of time, who are in lead roles or in supervisory positions uh, and really do play this role as kind of a core team uh, that maintains our culture and kind of brings any new team members into this really high functioning environment. So that core is you know, a lot of team members who've come up through open hiring, but who are interested in staying here and are interested in continuing to grow their skills here. Uh, so that's one path for us that we're always trying to work on is how we create those pathways for internal promotion and achievement, because there are team members who are eager to stay here at the bakery, feel a lot of loyalty to the company, are excited by the work and would like to grow their skills here. Um, at the same time, there's team members who either the position doesn't work out here, and it could be anything. You know, we, we have similar challenges to a lot of food manufacturing sites. Time and attendance are one of our biggest challenges, just like anybody else. It could be something like that. It could be disciplinary issues. It might just not be the job for you. You know, we have team members who come on, spend a couple of weeks with us and say, you know, this is really not the kind of job I want to do. Like this, it is hard work. Uh, it's it's not an easy job on the production line. And, and that's fine, right? We're not going to judge you for... Uh, this is not really the job that you really wanted or a place that you feel you can succeed. And if that does happen, uh, we'll work with that team member. We'll link them to our in-house workforce development group that sits on our nonprofit side. They offer a number of different training certifications and they offer job placement services. So we'll connect them immediately to our own kind of in-house team to help them find that next step. Um, and then there are those who move on and just find something else that is an ideal spot for them or that is an extension of their learning here. So, you know, one arena we've had a lot of success in is with quality assurance technicians. You know, we've been able to promote a number of our line staff up through these quality roles and they have then ultimately gone on to other positions at other companies within quality assurance, which is a great field to kind of get your entry point into because there's always jobs available in that space. Um, so that next step piece, I think it's something that we're always working on and trying to think about what we can do better. Uh, but that's kind of the, the framework that we operate under in general. Um, Sarah, can you go to the next slide? So addressing the concerns, you know, I think in my time here and as I, you know, shared with, with, with folks about open hiring over the years, including, you know, our partners at Unilever and Ben and Jerry's, there are questions and concerns that can come up pretty consistently. Um, the first one we hear a lot of is workplace safety. Like, do you feel that you have incidents that occur at 
the bakery that are unusual uh, in our industry. And I will say that we've not seen anything here that is out of line with what we've heard other food manufacturers, our other partners in the supply chain, our raw material suppliers or our customers have seen in their own workplaces. We have not seen um, any incidents here that would lead us to believe or anyone here to believe that oh, the history of our, our, our team members in particular creates a situation with more risk or more violence. Um, I think in fact, when you look at some of the studies for folks who have spent time in incarceration and come out successfully into the workplace, those employees tend to be at a much lower risk of having those kinds of incidents in the workplace because they do value the position, they value the opportunity maybe more than someone who uh, you know, thinks it's kind of standard, it's an expectation I should be able to get a job. If you are somebody who's spent time incarcerated and, and do come out with maybe a fear that you're not gonna be able to find that job or you deal with a lot of rejection in the workplace, when you do find a job willing to take you, you actually exhibit a lot more loyalty and an attitude of really hard work and, and, and teamwork versus somebody else who, who doesn't appreciate the opportunity in the same way. Um, Negligent hiring is another risk we hear people a lot of uh, a lot of concern about that folks think, okay, what if I hire somebody I didn't do a background check, then some incident happens in my workplace and now I, I'm liable right I didn't screen this risk out for my employees here or my customers here. Uh, you know what we've learned in our conversations actually with folks in the legal world over the years is that employers run a much greater risk of incorrectly using a background check or getting faulty information. You know, a lot of those, those companies or third party services we might trust to run a background check for us. Maybe they're pulling up somebody's sealed records incorrectly. Maybe they don't have the latest ruling from a judge that has cleared somebody's record. There are a lot of mistakes actually made in the hiring process from what we've heard from our legal counsel um, around folks being hired uh, or not hired based on faulty information out of those background checks. And that's actually a greater liability to a company that you've screened someone out inappropriately when that background check was done uh, was done incorrectly. Um, so we again don't see, and again, based on like what we see in our workplace, we don't see that there's a greater risk or a risk of not liability for taking away some of these traditional barriers during the hiring process. Uh, and then finally on the company brand perception, I think this is such a pertinent question in today's environment. You know, I think with, um, you know, the recent like murder of George Floyd, with the recent discussions around uh, just where society is heading in general, I think there is such uh, much more of an imperative on companies to demonstrate real commitment to value. You know, I think the conversation is almost moving beyond a brand perception to how can you really demonstrate clearly to your customer base that yes, not only am I talking about this value, not only am I building a marketing campaign maybe around this value, but I am demonstrating in a meaningful and concrete way that I am committed to bringing this value to life within my organization and within the communities I serve. Um, so I think for us here at the team, you know, seeing the team that works here, it feels like the right answer all the time. You know, you see the team that comes out here and for those of you who ever get the chance to come visit the bakery or uh, come take a tour with us, meeting the team I think really puts a lot of these fears aside and makes you realize that this is so much more than creating a brand perception. This is about doing something really meaningful, really tangible for your community to create real change. Um, so I think for us, the brand perception or a risk that you're doing something risky by hiring people without asking these background questions. I think the imperative on the other side to create real value and demonstrate to your customers uh, that you're moving into that space uh, is much more, uh, much more the critical kind of target these days, so to speak. Um, so with that being said, I will, I will pass it back to Sarah. I know that was a mouthful. So we have some Q and A at the end. Uh, and if any, I see there are some questions dropping into the Q and A section as well. So we'll be keeping an eye on those, but uh, thanks very much, Sarah, back to you. Thank you, Sunita. Um, I know it is not easy to distill an entire human capital strategy into 15 minutes, so I appreciate you doing so. And yes, please continue to submit questions um, through, through the Q&A, and, and we'll try and address some of these some of these at the end. Um, Trish, we're coming to you. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you again for for joining us um, really excited to, to share your experiences with with this audience today um, let's start at the beginning uh, which I think was about a year and a half ago when you guys first learned about open hiring so let's start there would love to hear from you how did the body shop first come across open hiring and more importantly why did it become a priority for you guys yeah absolutely so um Last January 2019, the Body Shop rolled out a new purpose statement. We exist to fight for a fair and more beautiful world. 
And we were looking for companies who could come into the body shop and really help us start to socialize this, um, but also companies who were fighting for social injustice as well. And so Karen from your team came into the body shop and she explained this open hiring model. She told us all about Grayston Bakery. And I personally was very inspired by Karen and what you were doing there. And I wanted to take action. I, I, I couldn't wait to do the same thing. Um, and so it, it became like a passion <laughs> of mine. Um, and we could do the same thing in the body shop. We had a lot of employment barriers. I know we'll talk through in a little bit. Um, and how could I help eliminate those employment barriers um, and then um, create more um, of social mobility in our communities by tearing down these employment barriers? So it became a passion of mine and I worked through about a year of driving into the business. So when you pretty quickly, as I recall, made the move to eliminate background checks before even developing your rollout strategy for open hiring, why did you decide to do that and, and how did it go? So three years ago, I was offered this amazing position at the body shop. But before I became an official employee, I had to go through a background check and a drug screen. And I thought to myself, they don't even trust me and I haven't even started yet at the body shop. So I thought, it's gonna be the first thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna eliminate all of this, it doesn't make sense. Of course, I get there and it wasn't a real popular discussion to have with everyone to eliminate these, the background check or the drug screening. Um, so I got a lot of eye, eye rolls, I got a lot of crazy looks. So I let it go for about a year. And then again, when we rolled out our purpose statement, I took that opportunity to say, this is, this is right in line. If we want to create a fairer, more beautiful world, and I want to tear down employment barriers, eliminating background and drug just makes sense. So I finally got the organization um, to eliminate them. That was quite, quite impressive. Um, so once you did decide then to make open hiring a priority, where did you guys start? We started in our distribution center. Um, it, we have a distribution center in Raleigh, North Carolina. We employ about 75 employees permanently there, but every year we hire, as most companies do, seasonal hiring for our fourth quarter. And so we decided that we would start in Q4 with all of our seasonal hires, which are around about 200 hire, hires. And then, and so for what, what barriers did you have for those 200 hires and what changes did you have to push through to make this happen? Well, going back, I guess, to background and drug screening, I had eliminated them in our, in our retail stores and our home office, but I hadn't made a lot of progress in our distribution center just yet. So um, when we decided we wanted to pilot this, I mean, clearly that was the first thing we had to eliminate. And it was a lot of discussion and a lot of pushing with our COO, our leadership team and our distribution center um, you know, they operate heavy machinery and equipment. We can't eliminate drug screening. You know, we're going to have all these accidents. Um, so you, you go through each scenario with them one at a time. Um, we finally eliminated that. I even then pushed, we're going to, hi we're going to do open hiring um, in our distribution center. We partner with a temp agency. This temp agency helps us to find all these 200-ish seasonals. And we brought them in. We said, this is how we're going to hire. They were excited about it because it, <laughs> they're spending less time trying to find our hires. Um, and so we partnered with them. We came up with three basic, simple questions. I'm going to say we actually borrowed those from Grayston, actually. But they were, are you legal to work in the US? Um, can you stand on your feet for eight hours? And can you lift up to 50 pounds? And if you can do those three things, you can have a job with us. And that was all it took. And we filled those 200 positions very, very quickly. Before you even started hiring though, how did you, I mean, you all, you already had this workforce at the distribution center. Um, how did they react when you told them you were doing open hiring and, and was that a challenge to kind of get that buy-in from them? I, I remember being in, the, in, in our distribution center um, about this time last year. And having, you know, having a conversation around a table and starting to talk to our leadership team there and getting all the questions going back to the, the previous slide. Um, you know, we're we're going to hire criminals. We're going to hire people who um, are going to be disruptive. You know, what, what, and I got all these scenarios. And again, it was just responding to all of those. 
Um, we partnered with Grayston again. We brought Karen into our distribution center and we met with every person in our DC from every supervisor to every manager to every employee. And we told them exactly what open hiring is and isn't. And our purpose statement supported that. And no one left there thinking we can't do this. This is what the body shop is meant to do. Mm -hmm. um, and so the buy-in was actually pretty easy. Yeah, I, I get the sense in some ways that for those who, um, you know, are used to just packing boxes and maybe not even seeing the product at all, this was actually a way to kind of connect them to what the body shop is all about. Absolutely. It connected them straight back to our purpose statement. And, and they were talking to each other. We know people who can't find jobs in our own communities, our neighbors, our family. Now they have an opportunity to work for this amazing company as well. Right. So such <laughs> packing boxes, you're, you're changing folks' lives, which is yes. incredible. Okay, so you implemented the pilot. How, how did it go? Tell us tell us your some of your key success metrics. Then. Oh, it, you know what? It was amazing. We, um, you know, going back to, to, to Joe's original statement, you know, it, it, it is a business model. And of course, we're here to get product to our, our customers. And it's a very important for us to do that. But we use 50% um, less recruiting resources and less time. We reduced our turnover in November by 53% and December by 69%. And we had higher KPIs, higher production. I mean, it was the best hiring season we've had in that distribution center um, in many years, actually. It was so easy. It just felt so, so good. That, that is definitely blew away even my wildest expectations. Um, any kind of thoughts on why that was, like why the numbers look so good this season? Besides, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, it goes back to second chances. So we had many um, of our employees come to us and say, you know, I, I did have a prison record. I couldn't find a job. I'm going to be so loyal. You're not going to be disappointed in me. Um, and so they needed that one chance just to get their foot in the door. And a lot of it is about gaining you know, their self-confidence back, being able to come in and have a structured place to work. Um, and, you know, for, for us to really build that family at the body shop. So um, it was really pretty easy to do. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. I'm getting a message that the sound isn't working. If someone, um, if, if, you know, folks aren't able to hear for any reason, please let us know in the, in the Q&A or in the chat. Just tell us so we can, we can, it's, Seems like it's only coming from one or two folks, so hopefully others can hear us. Okay. And I brought my computer a little closer, so hopefully that's better. Okay, I'm getting some I can hear just fine. So, um, okay, so pilot went well, but you know, if any big learnings or or you know things you would do differently, um, or that you're hoping to do in the next time, the next holiday season that you guys. Yeah, have. look, the key learning is it works. I mean, that's the bottom line. We have not gone back to our traditional hiring process. We have stayed with open hiring since um, seasonal. What I wanna do differently for this holiday season is I want a lot of bold media. I wanna go out into the community of Raleigh, North Carolina and shout that the body shop is tearing down employment barriers. We're giving second chances and we want to increase the social mobility in, in, those, in the community where we serve. Um, and so that's what I want to do is just make it bigger and bolder this year in that community. Yeah, I do have uh, staffing uh, talking about, um, I'm getting some feedback on my own, um, go, talking about kind of going out to different places that they hadn't thought of before that they wouldn't otherwise go to to find folks, which I thought was really cool that, that you guys did. Yeah, I mean, they took what, you know, their bus, their mobile bus, their hiring bus, if you will, and they put it in the Walmart parking lot. Um, they took it to the unemployment office. Um, it was those non-traditional places where we could find talent where we didn't have the opportunity to look before mm -hmm. because we were going through background check after background check, um, just trying to find one person. Um, so it was so much easier. Mm -hmm. Now, you guys did receive already quite a bit of media attention for this. Overall, how did you guys feel about that attention? I know there was, there was good and there was some critical. Yeah. Overall, it was positive. We received over 500,000 impressions um, on that media coverage, and which is more than a typical holiday season for the body shop. Um, so that's how much press it's, it's, it's received. Um, we did have a few negative, if you will, um, articles, 
Um, but you know what? That just made me feel even prouder um, that this is what activism is all about. Not everyone is going to agree with you, um, but you're going to stand up for what you feel is right and what is right for the body shop. Great. Now, um, the world has changed quite a bit since that holiday season um, wrapped up in January 2020. So what has happened at the body shop during COVID and how does open hiring fit into that picture, if at all? Oh, for sure. Like, you know, like many other retailers or um, places across the country, our stores are closed. They've been closed for, for many months. My original plan was to roll out open hiring last month, actually, in our stores in June. Um, and so we've had to, you know, shift a lot of things like everyone else, but we are now going to roll out to all of North America stores, that's both U.S. and Canada, um, in Q4 with our seasonal hiring uh, for Q4. Um, it, it will be over 200 stores and it will be that entry level level customer consultant position is what we will use for open hiring. Yeah, so I was going to ask those retail stores and what, uh, what challenges as well as opportunities do those stores provide in terms of rolling out open hiring. It's obviously a pretty different environment than a distribution center. It is, but it's still an entry level position where we can train anyone to do that role, just like we can in our distribution center. Um, so sometimes I think we put up our own barriers, maybe not to roll something out, um, but it is a trainable position that we can give that opportunity to anyone. And um, I think for, for the stores, the barrier, quite frankly, is like any other barrier, Sarah, that when we roll out something with that many stores, it's communicating it consistently and making sure everyone is, is working to the plan. Uh, but that would be our challenge no matter what we, we rolled out in Q4. And I will say, having yeah, yeah, yeah. your store managers, they are some of the most engaged bunch of employees that I've ever interacted with. So I think you have you great, great champions in that, in that group of managers and supervisors to take this thing forward. And hopefully, again, that this is giving them more of a sense of, of purpose and mission in, in their jobs. Yes. Okay, so you have a lot of folks on the line that are considering doing this. What advice would you give, you are now the expert, um, to others that are considering considering adopting open hiring or removing barriers to employment in any capacity? It, it, I mean, you have to be pay, passionate and persistent. Those are the two things. Um, I wasn't going to drop this. Um, you know, it, it leads exactly back up to our uh, purpose statement it is what we should be doing as an employer and what we should be doing for our communities. Um, you have to think about, as Joe said, tie it back to your business, tie it back to your mission, your values, your purpose statement. Um, tie it back to, to an HR initiative about eliminating employment barriers. Um, you know, so look at it holistically. Um, and then I would just advise you not to put up your own barriers. Um, when we were wanting to roll it out to our distribution center, we don't have the path making yet. Um, we thought we needed to roll out unconscious bias training to all of our managers before we could do this. And we just kept putting up our own barriers. And I finally just said, enough, we're gonna do it. Let's just go for it. And, and, and that's what we did and it worked. Um, so you don't have to have it perfect is what I would say to everyone. Just try a little bit at a time and then you can come back around, get the key learnings and make it better. Well, thank you for your incredible leadership through this. I mean, I think we've just been so impressed with the way that you and, and other leaders at the body shop have just leaned into this and just said, you know, even without all the answers, we're going to make a change because the need is, is too great not to. And it's it's your guys' role as, as, a, as a business, a purpose-driven company to, to really address the challenges that you see. So, um, you know, we just thank the world of you guys. Um, and thank you. Thank you for joining us today and sharing some of your insights and wisdom with this group. Um, we have a few minutes left and I know there have been quite a few questions rolling in. So um, my colleague Erica has been taking a look at some of these questions and I think we'll moderate. And I think if, if ever, all the other, you know, Joe and, and Sunitha and Erica could come back up on, on video and then Erica can, uh, pick her target, uh, for targets for who, who she wants to answer some of these questions that we've been getting. Okay, thanks Sarah. And we've had a lot of really great questions come in, so let's jump right in. And I do know that Sunny's been answering some of these questions as we go along, so I'll try not to be redundant. 
um, some of the questions that um, I thought were pretty general were, uh, what sorts of companies and industries does this model work best for? Sarah, I guess you could you could take this one on. Yes, I can take this one on. Um, so open hiring works best for jobs that can be taught on the job, um, right? So the companies and industries that rely pretty heavily on substantial levels of entry-level talent are good fits for the model. Um, so that's distribution, retail, food service, manufacturing, construction, um, you can think of, you know, pick, pick your industry. Um, with that said, we think that organizations from any industry can be thinking about both how they can be removing barriers at all levels of the organization. So even at more senior levels, are there parts of the job description that may be screening folks out who really could do the job? Um, you know, does that job really require a certain degree or is it really about a certain skill set? So we hope that companies are thinking about that throughout their ranks. And then also, even in a company that's a professional services organization, um, you know, think about the job. Is there a job, one job even, in your organization for which you could hire the next person through the door? And is, are there places where you can create barrier-free opportunities, um, even if it's not the majority of your workforce. Joe, anything to add? Yep, you did a good job there. Next, Erica. <laughs> okay, so someone else wants to know, what is Grayston planning to do in Rochester? Great, great question. I know we have a few folks um, from Rochester on the call. We are, um, Expanding there uh, from we are looking for employers who are interested in adopting the model there. Um, we're obviously working with employers all over the country. Body Shop is national, actually global. Um, but we do think that there is a benefit to having a regional ecosystem to support open hiring. We obviously have that here, um, but we haven't replicated it elsewhere. And so we think because that path making piece, which involves developing partnerships with regional nonprofits or service providers. Um, it's not necessarily something that every business has 38 years of experience doing and may, may not necessarily make sense if you're just gonna do one open hiring job that you're gonna kind of invest in that, in that infrastructure. And so what we're doing in Rochester um, and our uh, newest team member Mubarak Bashir um, is, on, is leading that work up there is figuring out, okay, what infrastructure do we need to support employers in Rochester adopting open hiring. Um, we have a great, one of our, our board members is um, the CEO of a cleaning business there, Clean Craft, that has been doing his own kind of version of open hiring for a while and really sees the need for businesses to be doing this. Um, and so he's kind of been our anchor employer there and we're looking for others to join us. So stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Can you talk about how open hiring is gaining traction in the US and internationally? Joe, you want to take that one? Yeah, I can, I can take that. I mean, Sarah's already mentioned uh, what's happening in Rochester, but we have about 10 to 12 pilots going in Netherlands. We're partnering with a foundation called Start Foundation. So a bunch of manufacturers in the Netherlands are actually doing open hiring there. Uh, but I want to follow up on the, the other question and. Sarah talking about the ecosystem that we're trying to create here. We do want to see open hiring grow right here in our own backyard. Uh, we want to see as folks graduate through our system at the bakery after two or three years, I would love it for them to move on to bigger and better jobs with other employees in this area, Westchester County, the Hudson Valley region of New York. Uh, that's the idea is to really, that's why we have this call. So I'm hoping that there are bunch of employers on this phone right now who can um, think about how they could be a part of this, um, whether it's here in our own backyard or just where you are, but how can we create an ecosystem both nationally and internationally that provides these types of opportunities to folks so that they can have a thriving life and a thriving career. I'm sorry, Joe, did you finish talking? I'm sorry. I. I was on delay here. Okay. All right, we have another one come in and wants to know, how do you see the system working for smaller organizations? 
I don't know if it's any different. And Sarah, you can correct me. That it's it's really about looking at how it you think it could work for your organization. You're getting rid of an a barrier. You're getting rid of a an interview. You're getting rid of you know a background checks. How do you think that could work? Does that work with your front desk person? Does it work with your landscaping person? Your maintenance person? Really think about you think about just the basics of what open hiring is. Uh, what would it look like in your organization? And I really don't think it matters whether you're small. And I saw another question about a financial institution. Uh, clearly, I mean, there's regulations of my industry. And one thing that open hiring doesn't do is break the, break the law. But think about what is that position that could lend itself well to what we've outlined. And it's basically getting rid of those barriers that may not make sense for an entry level position, whether it is the front desk person or your baker or maintenance person. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. The, the companies over in the Netherlands that are piloting this um, are mostly smaller businesses doing it for a small you know, subset of, of their roles. And I think um, it can work. I think it's important that the entire organization really be a part of it. I mean, it's, we think that's important anyways, but I think it's even more important when it's a small company um, so that everyone is kind of bought in and excited about the idea of kind of giving these barrier-free opportunities and then providing some additional support which may be required. Okay, next question. What do you see in terms of retention rates of the trainees? Yeah, I, I, I can touch on that a little bit as well. Uh, so as I, I said earlier, I mean, and it's like the retention, turnover, that's something that we just need to think um, more about and really unpack a little bit more, but if you look at, so we looked at our numbers for last year, and so about 70 of our open hires that we have here, um, you know, just over 50 stuck with us throughout the year 2019. Um, so that means, you know, 20, 25%, you know, moved on for whatever the reason is. Uh, I see another question kind of speaking to this, and, you know, do we think that's a good thing or a bad thing? Um, you know, folks leave for different reasons. They leave because of, you know, attendance, they leave because they just don't like the job, or they just found a better job, which is even better. But uh, in terms of that retention, and I said, this is a tough industry that we're in. So you're going to see some turnover, you're going to see, and we can define turnover differently from the moment folks walk through the door for how long folks stay with us sort of by month or through the years. But uh, the thing you need to stay focused on and really think about when we think about open hiring is what is the opportunity that we're providing to folks and what is that impact to your locality, uh, to, to that community that you're in, to the people that you're serving? What is that impact uh, going to have when you give a job to someone? Here it's millions of dollars in salaries um, that we provide to the local economy. Then you add to that the multiplier effect of what that means. So when we think about turnover and retention, make sure that we're thinking about it in those terms as well. So I guess this may be one of our last questions. And I know Sonny had answered it, but I would like you to expand on the answer. So the question is, are there some very clear offenses, infractions for new employees that are not acceptable, communicated as such, and cause for termination? Um, missing work without notice, not following safety protocols. Um, I'm thinking maybe you could talk about the, pay the point system. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I did see that there was another question about that as well. So, I mean, I, what I would say to that is, look, we have a robust disciplinary uh, pro program in place at the bakery. So we actually are a union shop. So when our bakers become full-time line staff, uh, they're entered in our union here as well. So we work with the union closely, and we have some really clear guidelines on what those disciplinary steps are. So there are certainly certain things, and very similar to any other workplace, there are certain things that, if they were to occur, someone is subject to immediate termination. For referencing something like, uh, say, call outs or no call, no shows, the way our point system works is it gives people an opportunity to make some mistakes, to have some challenges around time and attendance, but then gives them an opportunity to bounce back from that. So say that you are a no call, no show one day. On our point system, that's three points and points in the system are a bad thing, right? So three points are not good on your record. As that point total increases, so as you hit the five point mark or the six point mark, HR is now really paying attention to that. There's your trend is kind of playing out on your points. Um, and that will be an intervention point for us where we'll bring in that care coordinator who works with us and say, 
say, hey, look, you know, so-and-so had really stellar attendance for the first month of their apprenticeship. Suddenly there are no call, no show for two, for two days. Can you sit with them and kind of find out what's going on? And so we'll take advantage of that opportunity to say, you know, there might be something going on outside of the workplace entirely that we know nothing about that is now negatively impacting this person's ability to come to work, you know? One example that jumps to mind is we had uh, we had one of our young bakers here who was a young father and his daycare situation fell apart. So he had been a, a really stellar employee on time, on for a shift every single day. Suddenly he was late, you know, five, six shifts in a row. And so HR was like, okay, this doesn't seem like him. Let's bring the care coordinator in. And she had a quick conversation and found out, you know, I'm having this real challenge with childcare in the morning. I've got to take care of the baby, get the baby to daycare. How can we work this out? Then we're able to find a creative solution for that person and support them through that and make sure they maintain the job. So I think it's a both and for us. We are very clear on here the expectations and we'll follow the disciplinary, you know, ladder if necessary and if and if there's cause for that. But we are also going to use those trends that we're seeing emerge in your performance to identify ways to really help you succeed and surpass that barrier. And, and I'll just add to that. I think Sonny gave a good explanation there, but be very, let's be very clear. Open hiring does not mean no accountability. Um, all we've gotten rid of is the interview and the background checks, the food, safety, professional standards. All of those need to be adhered to. Again, you know, Sarah said this in the beginning, you know, this is not a, a program. This is not you know, a promise. It's an opportunity. Um, when we're serving the likes of Ben & Jerry, Unilever, and Whole Foods, you know, we've got very strict standards that we need to adhere to. So we expect that from all of our employees, whether they're the OPA hires or you know the administrative folks, uh, they have to be adhered to. So we're very strict about that, and you know there is accountability in the process as Sunita outlined. Erica, should we pause there? Yeah, we should pause there. We're going to take over. Yeah, it is time, and yeah, also time. I will. Uh, I'll close this out, and and I, I wish we could continue this conversation because the the amount of questions shows that people are engaged, which is which is a good thing, and we we want the hard questions because those are the questions that we need to get answered for this model to get adopted. So we we want to stay engaged with you all. Um, first, thank you to to, our, to all the all. The, panelists uh, who joined us today, in particular Trish uh, from The Body Shop, and, and thank you to all the attendees for taking time out of your day to um, be with us and learn about open hiring. We do want to continue engaging with you after this. One hour is not enough. Um, you will see a link to pop when you exit the webinar to, see, to a survey after this, which we would love if you could take five minutes to, to fill out. And as an incentive, we are raffling off 12 pack of Grayston brownies, which are delicious if you haven't tried them. Um, so hopefully, well, it'll get you to, to fill that fill that out and, and that'll help us understand what you're interested in learning about next and, and how we can best engage with you. Um, but regardless, uh, if you want to get in touch, my email is in front of you um, and reach out to me. Uh, we want to connect with you, uh, whether you're already doing open hiring, like hiring uh, in your business, or whether this is so far off from anything you or your organization would normally consider, or you're somewhere in between. Uh, we want to talk, connect with you or a resource to you, um, and we want to stay in touch because this work is, is in critically important right now. So with that, uh, hope, thank you for joining us. We hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their Tuesday. Uh, stay, stay safe, be well, um, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>